Yeah. And oh. we are live uh, here at a, a super secret location talking about red ales and such. Uh, ah. I am Sam. This is uh, my good friend Jim Kenny from Green Flash Brewing Company and my man Jeff back there pouring up the beers. Uh, what, do we, what do we got here, Jeff? This is Mechanical Advantage. Mechanical German Advantage, Pilsner. German Pilsner. You guys have had that one before. Uh, Jim is a uh, national sales manager for Green Flash, so he's one of those road warriors that's out around doing, doing it all over the country. And uh, he's, he's a good buddy of mine. We've been drinking beer together for many years, and actually at this point we probably drank more beers together outside of Dallas than we have in Dallas. But now that I live here, we've got to turn that around. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, so uh, Anton, we are uh, including you. And cheers. cheers. So, Jim, is anything uh, specifically bringing you to Dallas right now, or are you just out doing the rounds? I moved here. So, I live up uh, near Fort Worth, uh, Keller area. Um, since we opened up Virginia Beach, this puts me right in the middle of the ah. two breweries, so it's yeah. my travel down back and forth. Plus, Texas has been in our top five states for as long as I've been around. So. We're continually growing here, and uh, you know, we want to kind of Texas. Texas, Texas, Texas drinks beer. Everything's bigger in Texas, right? <laughs> Even the bellies. Yeah, yeah. Trust me, my wife keeps reminding me of mine. <laughs> so. Yeah. So, uh, so Green Flash is one of my uh, one of my favorite breweries. Uh, it's one of the uh, the handful that I've actually uh, inscribed on my body for life. I think I'm. I think I get like a free beer or something like that down the or road. Or you get to steal the original sign out of the owner's <laughs> yeah, office and put yeah. it up in one of the restaurants, right? <laughs> nice. Well, uh, what's what's the what's the background for the sign? I'll tell the story about about taking it. Uh, so, Flying Saucer, who Sam's you know got definite close ties to, has always been a big uh, supporter of Green Flash beers, and when they were opening up their St. Louis location, Sam called up and said, hey, I'm going to St. Louis, you got anything cool? I'm gonna make a road trip to all these breweries and get something. I was like, well, you know, my, my owner doesn't stay in his office very much. I think we can figure a way to go get that original sign off the back of his wall. Wow. And so Sam came into the brewery one day and we went and removed that thing from his office and there was a nice outline of, <laughs> where of the what, dust. wallpaper where the dust and dirt collected. And the uh, I told the owner before, but yeah. he forgot or something. So he comes and goes, where the hell's my sign at? I go, it's on its way to St. Louis. Yeah, it's in the back of Sam's car. <laughs> that was great. So when you guys uh, first opened up, you took Stone's old original brewery? What nah, was, what was it the... wasn't Stone. Um, it was a, I can't even remember the name. Carlsbad Ale Works, I think, was the name of it originally. Yeah. And so our owner, Mike, he's a finance guy, an international tax guy, and then he kind of got bored with that, and he opened a brew pub in uh, Encinitas, California. Okay. And he was one of the first kind of, I won't say first bars to really get in, but he really loved the, the local beers from Ballast and Carl Strauss and Stone, you know, that have been around for so many years. And, um, the opportunity came up for him to invest into this Carlsbad Ale Works. And to make a long story short, <clears throat> that was struggling. Mike and a few of his uh, buddies got together and they took it over, renamed it Green Flash and hired on Chuck Silva back in the day and, uh, you know, told Chuck to go out and make a benchmark let her San rip. Diego Brewery <laughs> and call it West Coast IPA, and so that kind of put us on the map. Right on. Yeah. That's cool. Uh, so that sign is hanging in the uh, St. Louis Flying Saucer right now. I actually, uh, we flew out there and rented a car, and uh, I, uh, you know, being a beer dude, I flew out to California, rented a car, we drove out to all the breweries and all the places, and literally loaded up uh, uh, like an excursion, like some sort of massive <laughs> vehicle. It wasn't just like a, like a forerunner. It was like a real deal, like suburban or something. Cause it had to be, cause that sign was big. It just, yeah. you couldn't, can't just throw that in the back of a car. Uh, and fortunately it was flat. So beer yeah. stacked real nice right on, <laughs> right on top of it. And we loaded that, uh, we loaded that car up. I mean, there had to be 30 cases of beer that I brought home on that trip. Uh, in addition to the yeah, cool the thing sign. was kind of leaning in the back a Definitely. little bit. Definitely. I found um, there was a couple things that really struck out to me to that trip. One was uh, the hospitality that uh, that Lost Abbey showed. Uh, we went there, and being a Texas guy, Lost Abbey never, uh, 
you know, I've never sold their beer. I'm not anybody to them. But right. like just through our conversation, it came up that I was a, a beer guy and uh, I was bummed. I was three days too early for like the track eight release and, uh, you know, was buying beers and merch and stuff to take home. And the guy, uh, the bartender, I guess, who's one of some sort of level of management right. was like, hey, you want to you want to try it? I can't let you take it with me, but I'll run across the street to the warehouse and grab it and pop one open right now. So I yeah. got to like drink an unreleased Lost Abbey beer with the bartender like just totally chilling and just because he heard I was a dude that cared about beer like yeah. that's that's what the beer industry is all about that's yeah, what I love absolutely. so much about it and then the other thing that really sticks out I'll skip the one that Jeff doesn't want me to tell and uh, <laughs> there's uh, uh, in like Flagstaff Arizona I was driving back from Southern California back to Dallas and um, on Beer Advocate there was some gas station rated like you know a plus or 95 or however they do their ratings i forget uh in flagstaff in arizona and i pull over and there's all kinds of crazy stuff and it's literally a gas station i yeah. filled up my car with gas i got a thomas hardy that like hadn't even been brewed in six or seven years at that point wow. like last time they brewed that was like 2008 yeah. and this is 2013 2014 so there was like yeah. english old ales that hadn't even been brewed in five years yeah. just sitting on the shelf at this place and I guess it's just a mecca for people that are crossing the country need to put put gas in the tank and yeah. it's just a regular old gas station and they they don't know anything about the beer but they're happy and they'll help you carry it out of your car and load yeah. it up and everything yeah, I wish I could remember what it was called like halls here yeah pretty much you know one of those just cool places yeah. you know halls halls never mind the dog you know yeah. it's, <laughs> it's like uh, that's one of the things that I really love is when you when you're just out in the middle of nowhere and you're just Google hmm, beer place and you find friendly people because friendly people hang out at beer places. Wait, so what's the story that you don't want, that I don't want you to tell? Oh, uh, me going to Stone and uh, and Stone uh, refusing to serve me alcohol because my girlfriend's ex ID was expired by 48 <laughs> hours. Uh, and then my buddy, I called Jason Armstrong and was like, dude, I'm at your brewery and they won't even let me drink a beer. Uh, and he called and <laughs> I feel bad. Jason, I love you. I'm sorry I put you in sorry, a position. You don't have to tell the story. No, no, it's okay. <laughs> and, and Jason's my homie and he called and uh, he was on the phone and I, I hear that and be like, yes, Mr. Ar Armstrong, I understand you're national sales manager, but I'm the, I'm the manager of this gift shop and I'm not selling him any beer. <laughs> and it was just like, Oh man, why did this have to get that bad? So went and toured the brewery and uh, was was refused beer. Escondido, the, the newer <laughs> yeah. facility, it's gorgeous. Though. Yeah, it's great. It's like it's 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 like uh, I wouldn't say like beer Disneyland, but it's like kind of like beer Sea World or something. You know, it's yeah. more like natural than than you think of when you think of a Disneyland. Disneyland's got that kind of fake thing. When they going put that on. hotel in, maybe it'll be beer Disneyland. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they're still doing that, right? I think that's been put on hold. Oh, it has yeah. because of the German brewery. Uh, I don't really know. I read it somewhere. You know, it's just that people are kind of keeping an eye on where they're putting their money these yeah. days, and you know, keeping it more on the beer. I think, but so you probably get this a lot. But what does Green Flash mean? Because I've heard like oh, several stories. So Green Flash, um, when you're sitting in California or on the west coast of Florida and the sun is about to set, if the conditions are right, right before when the sun goes down below yeah. the horizon, you'll see a green flash. Oh, nice. So that's what, you know, Mike, our owner, he's a former sailor and he loves sailing and the ocean and everything. And so they, uh, I, don't know, I don't know how they actually came up with it. I've heard one story that him and his partners were sitting around at one of the beaches drinking some beers and supposedly saw it go down and that's how they got it. I think yeah. they drank a lot of beers and yeah, saw that flash and took a nap. That's pretty awesome. Yeah, no, it's a. There's <clears throat> another a counter a subculture of beer that thinks it's like, eh, no, it's not, man. It's not the sun, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've gotten, I've gotten uh, confused because if I travel, I always wear a shirt. Yeah. And people ask me, they're like, do you sell weed for a living? And I'm like, <laughs> no, no, not yet. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> it is a good weed company name. <laughs> Um, I was, uh, Full Sail Brewing gave me a shirt. They gave me, like, a, uh, my buddy Chad Cumro, who you know, uh, he, they gave me, like, a one of those 
like a Tommy Bahama shirt with this like hot pattern on it, yeah. and it's embroidered with Sam and Full Sail on it. Very cool. And uh, so many people ask me if I if I work for Full Sail University, one of the like online colleges, I guess. Like Full Sail is the name of one of those. Yeah. I'm really blown away. Like 50% of the people that comment on that shirt, cover a hop Hawaiian shirt, oh, yeah. are like, oh, Full Sail University, online college, huh? And I'm like, <laughs> no, actually, <laughs> but. I didn't even know there was a Full Sail yeah. University. Yeah. <laughs> Apparently. Yeah. Um, and then uh, one of my other uh, favorite run-ins with you was when we were at, in Philly at CBC, and uh, their their mayor is named Jim Kinney. Yeah. Is, is that what was going on? <laughs> I walked into a bar and there was just like Jim Kinney signs all yeah, over the place. Yeah, my rep there decided to do all our events using. Come meet Mayor Jim Kennedy. <laughs> and it was me, and I didn't know about it till I walked in, and I was like, and I didn't even know the mayor was Jim Kennedy. Yeah, but yeah. So yeah, that I was like a good that. time. That's awesome. CBC is one of those. CBC is a craft brewers conference that takes place every year, and they, they move it around to different cities. Uh, so it's kind of a fun way for us all to go mix it up and check out a new part of the world. And uh, I guess three years ago that was when that, or yeah. no, two, no, no, two, two years ago because there was only Correct. one since then. Yeah. Um, it was up in Philly. Yeah. And, uh, boy, did they love cool. Benjamin Franklin. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah. Well, Kite and Key was the name of that one bar. Like, oh, yeah. Yeah. It was just every, it was like a quirky references to Ben Franklin. <laughs> yeah, this year's Nashville. Are you going? Uh, I hope so. Nashville's a really cool place. Um, we haven't bought tickets or anything, but uh, it's in May. So it's probably time to do that. Yeah, it's a it's a good time. It's now I'm just reading that Nashville is now like the number one destination for bridesmaid parties. They they beat Vegas out. So really, the tourism there is. You go into Nashville and there's just skyscrapers going up everywhere. I mean, it's kind of taken away a little bit from the uh, coolness and the yeah, yeah. of it, but it's just it's on fire. It's like, it's a fun city. I spent Thanksgiving in Nashville and we did. Uh, Went out to uh, Bearded Iris Brewing. I wanted to check out mm -hmm. Southern Grist and Yazoo, but I didn't make, get around to doing it. Jackalope's with, another like, uh, good one out there. With I family like and people. stuff. But the, uh, the Country Music Hall of Fame was like, I mean, I expected it to be cool. I just, I guess I didn't expect it to be as grand as it was. That thing's like a three, I mean, it's like the, it's like a museum. I'm like a real deal, like three story, uh, I don't even know how to describe it. Like Elvis's oversized Cadillac is in there. All kinds of really cool stuff. I expected it to be cool, just not like <laughs> yeah. two and a half hours of me being held, you know, interested. Cool. Um, and the surprising amount of Bob Dylan love being shown at the Country Music Hall of Fame. Yeah, didn't expect that. You really want to educate yourself. My buddy Skip from Ballast Point was just there, and he went to the Dukes of Hazard Museum, and Cooter actually runs it. So you get a tour no. from Cooter, and they got all the cars. He said it was one of the highlights of the trip. I'm going to book a tour with Cooter at CBC this <laughs> yeah. year. I bet those fill up quick. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> That's awesome. So you're also uh, you're also alumni of the flying saucer trips uh, that are that I no longer am fortunate enough to get to go on. Um, yeah, we need a we need a cotto trip, Sam. We need to go do some fishing. Well, we can go to Miramar without without all the hazing if you ever like to come. I'm game. I'm, <laughs> I'm, 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 like to go. Hey, if your dad doesn't make me paddle twelve miles in a canoe, I'm more than ready to go. Yeah, uh, no, that's what it, those are good times, and I think it's really cool. But, your dad and Keith and them do for all oh. the jams and take them out there and Absolutely. Kind of, you know, take real good care of the people. So. Uh, we're referring to a Caddo trip. I think I talked about it a couple episodes when I had Keith and Mark on here, but uh, uh, Caddo Lake is the only natural lake in Texas, it's out on the Texas Louisiana border. There's cypress trees and little islands out there, and uh, my dad's taken me out there since I was born, but. Uh, he takes all the GMs of the 16 flying or 15 flying saucers now, uh, and does he is he mixing in the rodeo goat people? Yeah, there were some rodeo goat some goat rodeo goat year. people, and they, they they blend them in there and take the GMs from the different locations out, and we uh, we have some nice fun outdoor time. Uh, some of the things are more fun than others, but like one of my favorites that ever happened was the put us all there in canoes. 
They had the trash bags of the McDonald's play pit balls. And they oh. all had point values, Sharpie yeah. on them. And so all these grown ass men are <laughs> out here in canoes, sinking other people's boats, trying to get the balls out of yeah. their boat. I mean, it, it was like demolition derby in, in canoes. Oh, they're throwing pool floaties out there. <laughs> I mean, Brad Batson from uh, Carbach. Yeah. He's sneaky. I got payback for him coming. He's, we, we were Jason from the uh, Arkansas Flying Saucer. He was my partner. He's standing up trying to get this big, like, unicorn floaty off that was worth a ton of points. Yeah. And all of a sudden, he gets it up and over this tree stump, and Batson comes by and takes it with his oar and just paddled away. Just we were scooting it right out from underneath us. I was like, oh, we got to get this guy. <laughs> Does anybody have a 22? <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's exactly what we were thinking. We need to sink his boat. Because you fall in that, you fall in that water. Your ears kind of perk up the way your dad talks about like alligators and all that crap in the oh, water. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, I don't want to be in this yeah. water at all. Yeah, it's like uh, six and a half feet deep, and the bottom two feet is just like Money. not stuff that you want to be walking around in. Hey, film that True Blood out there too. So, yeah. I mean, that gives you an idea. How yeah, kind definitely. Of, it's very cool looking, but it's like creepy at the same time. My little brother was out in his John boat and he came across a family like with an infant and their canoe had sank and they were like floundering in the lake out there. And he like just stumbled across them out goofing around and like loaded them wow. all into the boat and like, you know, potentially saved them. Well, that year when you were out there, we had people jumping off the pier into the water. I was like, no way, hell, <laughs> yeah. you can't get me to go in that water. Yeah, I think I might have thrown a backflip off of that, uh, <laughs> off of that dock. It's only six and a half feet. The whole the the whole thing, like deepest. Pretty much. Yeah. I mean, like, like if you go over to the Louisiana side, it'll be a little bit deeper. But, yeah. But it's pretty shallow. Yeah, it's a cool place to visit, though, for sure. Yeah. So, uh, who's got some cool green flash events coming up? Uh, well. That's a better question for Megan. Um, yeah. I know she's got some tastings coming up with like uh, Craft Beer Cellar. Um, she does stuff at Common Table quite a bit. I know in and out at your place, she's done some events. She had her birthday party at uh, Blind Butcher. I know, I, I popped I into that for a little bit. I, I meant uh, to, I didn't, I didn't make it. Yeah, it didn't go too late. It was, uh, people were going pretty big and strong. So <laughs> yeah, I, I can imagine, got out of I can imagine that was uh, uh, swinging for the fences pretty quick. Yeah, so it's, uh, uh, you know, we're releasing this new IPA, so she's going to be doing some samplings and events called Remix, and then uh, come around May, June time period, we're going to release Alpine Nelson full year-round, <clears throat> so we're pretty yeah. excited about that. We're going to put in the six-packs as well, so we were able to uh, secure, I believe, 25% of the, the hops in the world, uh, which is tough because it's all from New Zealand, small crop, yeah. um, but we're pretty excited because that's such a good beer. Definitely. So, Definitely. Mm, yeah. You know, when uh, then uh, one of the beers that when Hoppy Birthday first showed up, when you guys first brought uh, Alpine Hoppy Birthday into Texas, that is like, it's one of the beers I'll always remember. You know, you have yeah. like a couple of those little pints that you always remember, like the first pint of what we had of Rye IPA, I'll always remember yeah. like that. It's still like a background on my phone or something like that, but... Um, when uh, when Hoppy Birthday came out, that was or came to Texas. It had been out other places before, but that was right when session IPAs started happening, and no one was ballsy enough to call their beer a damn pale ale anymore. Right. Everyone was trying to like come up with these other fake names for their beer. Yeah. And that beer just came and it was like, I'm a five and a half percent pale ale, and I'm badass. It is badass. <laughs> it, one of my favorite stories on that beer was uh, when we were in Philly for that craft brewers conference yeah. and there's a guy who works out of illinois dave kale he's a uh, master cicerone right okay. he works for uh, breakthrough beverage we're proud Good master guy. failures yeah yeah <laughs> <a> master drinker <laughs> um but he walked into a, one of our events and we had a happy birthday on and it's always like ah, what's this guy gonna say about it you know because he's he's pretty straight and narrow on, on people's beers he'll tell you what he thinks and mm -hmm. he was like hey that's one of the best pale ales i've ever had and i think it gets shadowed by so much of the IPA phase that's out there. People don't see IPA or India Pale Ale, yeah. and they just brush right by it. But if Move past it. Yeah, that's, that's a fantastic beer. Yeah, you really have to, like, you're not relying on any help if you call your beer Pale Ale. You just have to put badass in a can or a bottle and, like, you know, yeah. hope people actually drink it. Yeah, people that know it, you know, they, they know what that beer is. And yeah. so it's, it's, it's still holding its own out there. So just, uh, you know, it's 
the industry, you know, you guys see it as much as the rest of us are so saturated these days. And you, you know, you go in and rotating tap handles and trying to, you know, the days of getting a permanent tap handle on a wall somewhere is far and few between. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> it's hard for people to build brands or for people to get recognition of brands like that. And uh, I think it's going to be a struggle for a few more years, you know, while <clears throat> we figure out where the industry's going. But, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's a battle. You come into, like, Texas, right? How many breweries are in the state of Texas now? I mean, it's something ridiculous amount five years ago we had four breweries within 35 miles of where we're sitting right now yeah now where are you guys at i mean it has to be 65 yeah and it's great i mean totally guessing someone google that and chime in and let me know what the real answer is i mean we all started off as small local breweries I mean, yeah. we started off i think we were 16th 15th maybe in san diego and I it's like 155 in San Diego right now, you know, and so it's uh, just in San Diego. It's tough, it's you know, and you get beers coming from out of state, and they're great beers. Yeah. You know, they don't they don't have the traction because everybody gets so wrapped around the local thing, and it's always my first question to a bar. You know, I went into a bar in Cincinnati, Ohio, for a meeting with Kroger. I was meeting them later the next day, and. Uh, Brand new bar opened up. Three buddy college buddies decided they wanted to own a bar. That was always their dream, right? And I was in there at seven o'clock on a Thursday, and there was like three people in the whole bar. And then myself, my distributor rep, and the three owners. And I'm watching people go left and right by the bar. And I'm like, what's going on here? All they had was they had 18 taps. Every one of them was local. Yeah. And that's great. You got to support your local breweries. Yeah. But my theory too is. You know what, what's the draw you know what's the draw to your place you know you put a bar top in and a tap in what, what's going to bring me in here you have you know in this day and age people are doing trivia and bar bingo it's all about and karaoke and events. And you really yeah. got to figure a way to draw them in and i really think you got to start bringing in beers that's not on every tap within a two mile radius of your your establishment you know split it up 30 percent local Keep, you know, yeah. partner with your partners, rotate some others in, and find some cool stuff that's out there and really get people exposed to other beers than just what's in the local market. And uh, I don't know, it's a, uh, I know people have different opinions on that yeah. all the time, um, but it's uh, it's definitely a tough market out there. I mean, what, I think we're at 7,000 or plus in the United States now, or just yeah. about 7,000. That's a lot of breweries. What? Well, I'm a local brewer, but as you know, I'm, you know, a beer guy first Absolutely. and foremost. I didn't start being a local brewer until I had given a shit about local beer for t or about everybody's beer for 10 years. Um, and one of the things that I think is the trickiest part and, you know, I'll put on my evil businessman money making hat here for a second is like as a local brewer, we have Green Flash and other guest beers on tap. Uh, and we get to kind of utilize some of your marketing efforts and being like, hey, we're going to come and do a Green Flash event. Let's you guys scream about Green Flash and we're going to scream about Green Flash. And, you know, let's all let's all have a good time and and, and and pile our lists together. I think people these days are so dedicated to, you know, trying to kind of keep their community that people aren't helping out their brother quite as much as what craft did back in the well, day. The kumbaya days are long gone. Yeah, you and know, that's and that's kind sad. of the sad sad part about yeah. it. You know, it's like I like I love giving the reference of in uh, in San Antonio, the Flying Saucer down there. My old GM, Real Ale Brewing, was delivering out of a hatchback, and they would break down on 281. And I remember being the bartender, and my GM was like, I gotta go, real ill broke down, I gotta go scoop up their beers and help them finish their deliveries. Yeah. You got the shop? And I was like, uh, yeah, I guess. Like, I wasn't the type of person, I was 21 at the time, I wasn't the type of person right. you leave in charge of the saucer, but uh, you had to like go and run down and you know help them out and, and do the thing, and this is so cool. Like, it was just a, that was a bar and then a brewery. It wasn't even, a fellow brewer it was just somebody else trying to make the craft beer thing happen um, and, and I think a lot of times we're we're so caught up in the craft beer scene it's easy to feel like it's everywhere but it's not we're only like 20 percent of of the beer that's being drank out there and um, I think it's important for us to remember that that ain't shit oh, yeah. we all have to work together in order to to be that you know it's us versus them as in like 
all of the people making good beer versus all of the people making shitty beer. We can't be drawing a circle around Dallas and saying that this is the us and everybody else is the them. Even within Texas, you know, you guys are out in Southern California, and I think mm -hmm. of you guys as as much of a partner in what we're trying to do as the brewery that's down the street. So, Absolutely, yeah, we want to um, see crap here grow, and you know, I'm stoked for you and what you've done with Brain Dead, and you know, like try your man. dad. <laughs> you know, I gave your dad and he <clears throat> tons of credit for the craft movement in Texas. You know, you go to sure. you know any restaurant damn near anywhere and try and get more knowledgeable servers than what the servers at a flying saucer know about beer. I mean, they really make sure that when they walk up to that table, they're just not hawking beer. They're going to help educate the consumer, especially with people coming over from drinking fizzy yellow to craft. You know, you don't want to, you don't want to say a Mick ultra drinker off from a West coast IPA right off the uh, start, uh, right? Cause you nope. may just turn them off on craft all together. Yeah. So, you know, the service a, there are educated and they doodle. ask the question, you know, yeah, you know sneak them in or now, you know, you got all these blondes and pilsers coming out that are, you know, easier drinking, you know, walk them up the chart a little bit. Yeah. You know, I, I started off selling Miller light and Coors light 25 years ago. And I remember when Sierra Nevada, you know, we started selling that yeah. and Sam Adams. And I remember making a face when I would drink it, drink it. And, you know, you compare the happiness now to then, yeah. you know, but it, it took a little while, you know, you just get used to drinking slamming Miller Lights all day and, you know, that's still a great beer. But, us, us craft yeah. folk like to say uh, that you never meet an ex-craft beer drinker and that is 99.9% .9 true. But my old roommate uh, is one of the only people that I've ever met that like falls into that ex-craft beer drinker category. Oh, no. It was after we came back from a Caddo trip, and uh, we always bring so much beer on that trip, obviously, because it's a bunch of beer drinking people. Come back from Caddo, and I'm bringing a cooler of, uh, of like, Maretsu and Duval and, like, big Belgian stuff, because we right. drank all the lagers and the IPAs while we were there, and all the, yeah. like... 8 to 12 percent alcohol Belgian <laughs> stuff was what was left in the cooler. Nothing against those beers. Huh. We were just drinking a lot of beer that weekend. Were you, you fishing? Can't do it. What's that? Were you fishing? No, it was one of the like Caddo retreats. Oh. Like the cooler, like the bulk coolers oh, of all right. of the beer came back. And I brought it back to my house. And uh, I like left town for a couple days because at that time I was traveling to the saucers. And I came back home. So you drink while he talks. I came back home yeah. and my. Uh, <laughs> I came back home and my roommate was like laying outside on the porch, drunk, surrounded with like Belgian beer bottles all over the place. And I was like, hey buddy, you all right? And he was like, I can't handle the craft. <laughs> I was like, what? And he's like, there's too much booze in this beer. I'm just not used to it. And he was all like wobbling around on the porch. Oh, man. And he uh, he went back to Michelob Ultra after that. I after that wobbled weekend. around your porch once or twice. I see how that could happen. Indeed, indeed. See, our relationship started back in the day when uh, being just another saucer guy, it was before I had moved up all the way in the saucer and I was just another manager in Austin. Uh, and I used to try to make people remember me by trying to get them so drunk they missed their flights the next day. That was how I formed my relationships with the, <laughs> with, yeah. with the higher ups. Was I, well, I would make them remember me. You know? Yeah. <laughs> you know? I remember Ted Whitney, the old Avery sales manager, I, he, he genuinely missed his flight the next day after partying with me in Austin. He was like, all right, Sam, I, I know who you are now. Yeah. <laughs> you'll, you'll always be I on know what the you list. Did. Uh, we had a blast in, in Nashville. We, we both partied together in Nashville. I guess that was back with Gabe at Old Crow over in Five yeah. Points. Yeah, that absolutely. Was, uh, and that guy from uh, from Cisco, the like the glass maker. I remember dude. that guy, yeah. Yeah. Oh, what's his name? Uh, shoot. I wish I could remember him. The glass Super, maker is a pretty sweet name. Super cool dude. Well, yeah. we, at the saucer, we made just billions of pint glasses all the time yeah um so he was the he was like our liaison for making these pint glasses and i went out to nashville for the flying saucer beer feast out there and you just happened to be out there for something and I think probably we did a beer dinner out there and yeah um and then we were eat, drinking at a place called old crow and then and three it's, crow three crow is that what three it's called yeah, three old crow. crow is the uh greenville oh yeah old place. crow's here yeah three crow uh it was a good time. Same idea, like dive. Oh yeah. 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 
It's a great bar, but it's one of those. <laughs> it's one of those old school day drinker bars yeah. that turned into a craft beer bar. Yeah. So you got a good mix of people in there, and uh, it was. I remember that place because there's a lot of old timers that went in there that have shifted into craft. Yeah. You know, just because they were sitting there, they're saying, hey, "Let me try one. Let me try this one." You know, and then it, and then you get these old guys that go in there kind of like me now i'm an old guy that goes into the bar early in the morning yeah. but uh <clears throat> yeah they're, they're drinking craft beer now instead of just the regular you know. i was trying to get you to try this that's what i was saying. oh he was he was I saying you need to, to drink more <laughs> <laughs> um when i went out and took my uh <clears throat> certified cicerone uh, there's a place called churchill's oh yeah that place that that place is awesome yeah our guy that runs all of our um tasting rooms he was a. Uh, Bar is that Mike? No, Dave Adams. Dave, uh, Dave, Dave. Yeah, yeah. Mike's the owner. Sorry, Mike's I swapped swapped that. Dave has a beard like rivals mine. Yeah. Um, he supposedly I heard the story that when he's laying down in bed at night watching TV, he has to put something on it because it pokes up and blocks the TV. <laughs> because a <laughs> book that he lays on his chest. Uh, I have a I have a little rescue puppy at home, and uh, he was Hurricane Harvey rescues like tied up in flood water and just like first two months I had him he couldn't even deal with like a, a human like right. he, just, he just didn't want to do it he had been kicked enough times uh, and he loves my beard if I'm laying on the couch he'll come and stick his nose just under there and just start snoozing like it's just <laughs> like a I guess it's like a little warming Shade. warming blanket or something uh, but he loves sticking his nose up underneath there I'm like how is that even comfortable that would tickle my eyeballs yeah uh, man. that's good beard Thank you. Yeah, it's You're actually done. you know modeled modeled after one of the beers we were asking you about the uh, the Hophead Red being you know one of the OGs. I, yeah. Uh, I wasn't trying to say that your beer was very '90s. I meant to say our beer was, <laughs> was very '90s. But like Red Ale was like a circa 2000 kind of like yeah. uh, thing when people were really into that. Uh, it'll all come back around. It's all I cyclical. Think. You see how people go. I mean, you go back five years ago six years ago everybody's drinking the hoppy as big as yeah single or double ipa yeah and that's kind of transition and red ales were pretty prominent back then and then the red ale started dropping off well and you guys have palette record which is like the definition of what was sought after yeah you know? but that's even dropped off over the years you know there's just so many new entries into the market and you know i've literally been at a buddy of mine i think i might have taken you there the uh regal beagle in san diego He's, uh, you he's told got, me to go. I don't think I made it. He's he's got a great bar. I think Keith might have made it in there, but we were sitting in there one night and just I wasn't wearing green flash or anything, and he had Pilot Wrecker on, and people come up to the bar like, nope, I've already had that. I got to try something new, you know. So it's yeah. always the new toy syndrome that oh, yeah. I got to see what's new and exciting out there, and so just you know trying to keep it out there. But I made a I made an unpopular statement the other day in our local Dallas internet group. Um, was that that whole like chasing the beer you haven't had before thing starts to subside after a year three four five mm -hmm. and like you start to just be happy with the beer that's on tap um, and you know some people really 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 strongly disagreed with me in that sentiment I actually had had lunch with a guy today that I met uh, we had like an internet fight and so at the end yeah. we were like hey man let's uh, let's have lunch and you know, squash it. Thank you for the adult conversation. We're friends now. Let's yeah. go do that. And, and he he drove and had lunch with me at Brain Dead today, and it was it was super cool. You know, it's like we can all be passionate. We can be out there, and we can be saying what we need to say. But like the internet just kind of takes the friendship out of it sometimes. You know, like you're you're an old school dude. Like if you and I got in a big fight, like we'd like each other more after it. You know, yeah. like that's just that's how hanging out in person is yeah, uh, and on the internet just, you can just you walk somebody you want to erase them from your life you know yeah, yeah well you watch um yelp you know your restaurant too so i mean you know <laughs> yeah you know there's people in there yeah, that's amazing <laughs> yeah it's amazing the stuff that you read on some of these yelp reviews you'll see boom 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 all these great reviews and then you get somebody that just had a bug up their ass yeah. and just rips yeah. them apart, you know? And it's like, you know, once that's there, it's there. You know, you can't get that off. Right. You know, it's got to work its way, I guess, down the feet or whatever. But, you know, people are the same way on, on Beer Advocate or a beer. You know, it's like, hey, it might not be for you. You know, not not every right. beer is... Yeah. We, what's our time limit? Yeah. Uh, well, we run out. Well, we run out of. We run out of camera space at 40, 42 minutes today. So uh, good. Oh. We got We got. We got six minutes. <laughs> 
Um, but yeah, so you know, it's just one of those things. You gotta you gotta get out there and, and mix it up and drink beer. It's like I was telling you. That's what Growler Stations is about. We're just gonna sit down. We're gonna drink some beer and some natural conversations gonna happen between you know two people Absolutely. that are drinking beer. Three people. No, I like drinking that. I was beer. watching that. Like I told you, I was watching that one you did with Keith and Mark and Costado. And uh, Mark's the only person that's ever come to the table with a, with a full yeah. pint <laughs> before we open <laughs> before we open the Growlers. He's a great guy. He was my partner at Costado. I didn't think Ooh. he was gonna talk to me after that though. He he uh, yeah. worked twice as hard as I did. <laughs> I was in the back and he was rowing, and I was like, oh, I'm going to drink another beer. <laughs> yeah. Well, the front is for the power. The back is for steering. So, you know, the, that's, the way, that that's the way. I didn't do that either. That's the way canoeing's supposed to work. Yeah. Yeah, I like this this format. And I'm curious to hear about the other guys you got coming up. You know, you're saying, yeah, you know, I got Adam Avery uh, coming up. I for, I'd have to look in my calendar, but Adam Avery's coming up here in about six weeks. I'm talking to uh, Jay Jarrier, who owns Connie Rosso here in town. Uh -huh. They have their uh, seventh anniversary of the beginning of their thing, um, actually on Monday of next week. Talk, trying to get him involved to do that. And then uh, Carolyn Perini uh, is Easy Slider. One of the cool little like food truck spots that opened up a um, that opened up a brick and mortar down the road from us down in Deep Ellum. Very they cool. make all these cool like tequila cocktails. It's one of our favorite uh, places to sneak off when ah. you get done to go have uh, a meeting. Outside yeah, they do meeting. a they do a tequila shot called the Crackle with uh, a chicharron full of hot sauce, and that's the chaser of the tequila <laughs> shot. Uh, it's a sounds good way weird, to, but works. it's a good way to sneak yeah. off. <laughs> Uh, and then Adam Avery uh, is coming up here in about two more two more months. That'll be exciting. Uh, you know, having having Keith on there was super cool. I mean, you know what a he's got a ton of knowledge. God, man, it, it's just great. And I think I was kind of giving us some. <laughs> <laughs> I think, uh, like I was saying, I mean, I give them a lot of credit for helping build craft. I mean, because yeah. of their bars, they really did. They exposed well even before craft. They started pushing all the imports and. What other beers are out there? You know, kind of, yeah. you know, getting people to kind of question what they drink every day and try something new and different. And, uh, you know, and it's, you know, now I look at look at this city. It's crazy. I love those old pictures of uh, baby boy Keith Schlabs and Michael Jackson that he has in his <laughs> office with his like little goatee, oh, yeah, go yeah. goatee thing he was doing and all that. Man, that's great. Yeah. Michael Jackson and beer is not uh, this Michael Jackson that is commonly thought of when you say Michael Jackson. He's uh, he was a beer writer, and he, he wrote about whiskey, too. Uh, but he was the first person to really uh, travel the world and talk about beer. And uh, I don't know what to compare him to to other industries, but, but Michael Jackson is, is kind of that person that everybody in craft tips their hat to. And him and Charlie Papazian. Uh, is there anybody else you'd put on that list? It's like Michael Jackson and Charlie Papazian are like the, the Mount Rushmore. You know, like who else do you put on? Yeah, I mean, you know, crap you look at, still looking like I still gave a lot of props to Jim Cook, Sam Adams, because he opened yeah. the doors for none of us would be sitting here without Jim. There Cook. you go. I mean, he is a uh, Jim he's Cook, Ken Grossman, yeah, Ken Charlie Grossman. Papazian, and Michael and Michael Jackson. You heard yeah. it here first. That's there the Mount. Go. That's the Mount yeah. Rushmore of crap. And you could throw in Fritz Maytag from Anchor Steam because he was doing yeah. it. He never got the same you know press as a lot of the other guys. There but, you go. You know, Anchor Steam's solid brewery. There you go. I like that. Good friends. You know, that was one of the things I really liked about uh, Sierra Nevada's 30th anniversary run was all those, like, Chuck and Jim and Steve and Pete's, like those beers that they made. Yeah, yeah. I forget exactly Ken what they Fritz. were called. Yeah, yeah, Ken and Fritz. But they, you know, a, a brewery is like, <laughs> you get what I'm yeah. saying. <laughs> a brewery as big as Sierra Nevada, you know, the owner on the precipice of making his billionth dollar. And, uh, you know, they... They still took the time to, to you know, I read an throw interview it with him for everybody he's, else. And I've met him a few times, and, you know, he's just a really good guy. Yeah. And they're, they're still a family he's business, business you know. So. Yep. <laughs> solid. I don't want to interrupt. You go ahead. No, no, I'm just checking. I was just saying that, you know, the they're a solid brewery, and, you know, I like that they kept yeah. it independent and family. I, I saw it, it like, a, 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 he had a beer dinner at uh, Moth, actually, and, like, most... I mean, obviously he has tons of money, but he's still super down to earth. Like talking to people and like the way he, the way you, you talk, he talked, you can just tell that he was like, you know, meant what he said and the stories were like, it, it, it was a genuine dude. Yeah. Jim Cook or Ken Grossman? Ken Grossman. Grossman. Yeah. Ken's, That's who you were talking about, right? Yeah. Ken did a video on uh, 
Sierra Nevada, and it was like him and his mom. And it was Ken Grossman sitting on the couch with his mom. And I'm sure they found somebody else's house because it was like, a, you know, just a house, like a normal little home. And uh, she's telling the story about like her son starting the brewery. And like everybody is when they're around their mom or dad. Yeah. And, like sitting there being the little kid again. You know? <laughs> That's pretty awesome. I, oh man, I loved it. It was super cool. And, yeah. uh, and like you can tell, I mean, Ken Grossman's still a. A, a grown ass man, you know, but you could just tell that he was like around his mom talking about him. It was a really, you know, it personified him a whole lot to me as someone who, yeah. you know, went to beer camp in 2008. I remember Terrence at Sierra Nevada uh, made a, like, there was like cash bets going on that Sierra Nevada would never end up in a can and like oh. all, all kinds of stuff like this. This was 2008. The word, the word never means just not right now. Oh, I mean. no. But it was three years later. It wasn't even a long time well, before can't things. Can't condition in the can. <laughs> yeah. Trust me, I mean, our owner, he's like, a couple years ago, we'll never put beer in a can. We'll never put fruit in our beer. We'll never do this. And now we all just say, Passion yeah. fruit kicker. <laughs> we're not doing it right. We're just not doing it right this second, but we will be doing that it. That guy's a character, soon. man. I met him uh, last time you guys came in, I guess. Yeah. Oh, hey, man. hey, here's the thing. He's like, he's so energetic. He's passionate. He loves, he loves everything he does revolves around us selling beer and, yeah. and staying independent. I mean, he he really wants to, you know, kind of keep this and thing. loves fuck as much as I do. The word fuck. <laughs> oh, 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 excuse me. Oh. Am I not allowed to say that? Uh, so when he gave me a brewery tour of Green Flash, he was like just left his son's soccer practice or football practice or something. He was wearing like cleats and had the whistle yeah. around his neck and everything. He was in like he coached football. Coach he coached both. a local yeah. high school. And he, I mean, uh, he was wearing like his coach outfit. Yeah, he gave right. me the, the green flash tour. I think he's got a state championship ring from that year or something. Right. He's pretty proud of. Good. Yeah. All right. So I think good. that's it. Can we close it out? You want to cool. uh, You want to even that beer out, or you got that? What? We got to finish it. Sounds it's good. time we're running out of memory. <laughs> all right. All right. Hey, thank Cheers. you guys all for watching. Thank you, Central Track. Thank you, Anton. Thank you, Jim from thank Green you. Flash. And uh, all of you guys out there watching, I appreciate you coming out and uh, tuning in to Central Track. Uh, don't forget, we upload 4K a couple days later over on our YouTube channel at Growler Stations. Up to our 24th subscriber. Feeling pretty good nice. about that. Uh, and this was episode 13. No, no, no. <laughs> I, was, admit it too. I was telling him about all the, you, the language oh. requirements. <laughs> All right. Well, I might need a job. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Well, I need a salesperson probably. <clears throat> and we're out.